Venezuela What you've had in the last 20 years in Venezuela was, you know, the, the, there was the loss of power of an elite that was accustomed to, you know, making their deals with the IMF, with the World Bank, with, you know, uh, that lived off uh, trading bonds, and, and that sort of, you know, went away, even in the oil industry. I mean, this, the, the oil industry in Venezuela used to be run as if it was a private company with no concern, uh, you know, uh, uh, for, for the social well-being of the country, but rather its internal development. And then the problem is that, you know, uh, uh, President Chavez came with a mandate of, of you know, helping people because it, it, it didn't make sense that we were such a rich country, that we had such a rich oil company that was state-owned, and there was no reflection of that on the streets. So the first measures that we're taking from the beginning by President Chavez and then followed through by President Maduro, but the first measures that we're taking was how do we tend to the social issues that we have? I mean, we had... We have a high, uh, 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 at that time we had a high uh, uh, poverty rates, we had illiteracy, and, and after, you know, the first program started coming in, we freed Venezuela from illiteracy. We got, uh, we opened up uh, um, medical coverage to, to the people, education. Right now Venezuela is, is the country with the fifth largest uh, university enrollment in the world and the second in the region. Uh, we have, even and even throughout this crisis, something that we have to recognize about President Maduro, I mean, we've been building public housing to a point that we had a 3 million home deficit in 2010. By now, we've already covered 2.5 million of those homes. We're very close to covering the rest. And that hasn't stopped even with all this economic uh, turmoil that, that we have received from, from outside. Because there's a consciousness in this government that you have to take care of, of, the, of, of the people. Yes, we didn't have enough time to switch the production model. We didn't have enough time to depart from oil, from an oil economy because those things take time and, and, and the process. I mean, we are inserted in a capitalist world order. We have, there's a division of labor where we've been assigned the production of this raw product. So it's, these are things that are difficult to overcome in time. And our priority was to, you know, to help people in their everyday life, at the, you know, where they were uh, being, you know, where there was a lot of suffering at that time, so that had to be a priority. Then, at the same time, trying to, you know, walk and transform, you know, at the same time, the productive system, but it's difficult. And, you know, things, things that would happen that, that people don't, don't know, because there, there's, sometimes they say, well, uh, the socialist policies ended up... Uh, um, nationalizing a company and then the company you know didn't uh, wasn't as productive as it was before well you have the case for example of uh, we nationalized the glass bottle companies that used to belong to Owen Illinois and fine you know we, we, we started working on that but but then they have patents and and there's property intellectual property rights over the models of the, of the bottles so, so there, were, there was all these limitations afterwards that you know that we that we couldn't that, that it was very difficult to overcome. We couldn't import some some of the peop, the parts from when machines broke down because they made a blockade. So this this blockade is not just the sanctions that were signed by President Trump in 2017, but this there's been a, a constant blockade against Venezuela of different types of, of, uh, of elements that have, that have hurt our economy and our development. If we don't have the patents to repair the machinery, then you know, we lose uh, some of those uh, efforts, and uh, despite the fact that you know, we could have made it more productive than it was before. Traditionally in Venezuela, the opposition has always, were the people that had, that had, uh, had a very well-to-do life in, in Venezuela, and the higher middle class, upper middle class, uh, people that lived off commerce because we don't have we don't really have bourgeoisie here that was productive. I mean, you have other examples in in other countries, Latin America, in Brazil, Argentina, maybe that where you had a bourgeoisie that invested somewhat in inside their own countries. And but we really didn't have that because of being an oil producing country. You basically 
uh, captured uh, oil rent and then it was distributed to these people who at the end of the day basically were importers and, and not producers. You know, a lot of uh, the Venezuelan uh, productive elite, uh, you know, sometimes argues that, you know, they have they've had limitations by the government or something like that. But at the end of the day, if they were to compete in a, in a full neoliberal scheme, with other countries, they wouldn't be able to do so because they, they you know, the, the way they lived off oil rent, you know, was was the way they secured, but they, they were not even competitive at the neoliberal level. So this is the type of people that want the government back. That's why you have a houseman in, in you know, deciding how the IMF is going to, you know, uh, uh, reconstruct Venezuela. I mean, look at, the, look at the example for Argentina, you know, not, not, not uh, you know, Macri, I mean, all the money coming in from the fund, though, is that money really reflected and for the benefit of, of, of the people? And that, that's, that's, nothing, that's not the, the model we want. And, and, and that's not the model that can win elections in Venezuela because people have raised their consciousness during the last 20 years. And they understand that they, they want a model that takes care of them. They want a model that, that gives them dignity. A, a dignified life, because that's what really, you know, the socialist model in Venezuela has been. A dignified life. And that means not the wealth for the elite, but, you know, something that people can, you know, help them on the, in the everyday and have hope of a better future. And that's what we're trying to build. Despite all the attacks and despite all the difficulties, that's where we're going. Well, it's, it's, it's been interesting to see the U.S. Uh, and, uh, because of you know the, the, what their high officials have said. You know, you, it's been interesting to see how much they, they how much effort they put in, in, into this, and the way that they've been participating frontally in the coup. I mean, we we were used to saying that you know the U, the U.S. government was behind the coup and so so uh, country, but this time you see them in front. I mean, you see that the, you know the uh, right before uh, Mr. Guaido you know, declared himself president and you had tweets from Mike Pence saying this is something that should happen and promoting this and, and that the, the military should help him and should obey. So, so it's very interesting to see that dynamic and, and that there is an obvious and open uh, uh, declaration by high officials that that's what they really, uh, you know, they want to see in Venezuela happen. Um, the timing, I, I think at the end of the day, you know, it's something that uh, it, it also serves uh, internal purposes in the U.S. The United States is about to uh, undergo another electoral cycle. I mean, it's, it's very early on the stage, but there will be elections next year. And that's why it's, it was not surprising that President Trump went out and, and, and did a, a, a speech specifically aimed at Venezuela, two Venezuelan Americans living in, in, in the state of Florida, where, you know, Nowadays, there's about 100,000 Venezuelan Americans that can vote and that can decide elections. And that's a large number that it could be swayed, you know, either way, it could give, you know, somebody a victory in a, in a state uh, as important as Florida. So there's, there, so the Venezuela issue is playing part of internal politics in the United States. And it's also playing part in internal politics when you see, uh, you know, uh, the, the we see people saying, oh, well, Venezuela is the example of socialism and socialism failed. And, and, it's, and it's, it's a concern because I, I believe that the changes that are going on now in the United States or the movements that have been growing that have had a more important presence there are movements that are some, somewhat um, I, or somewhat identify with the ideas of socialism or you know, so, so, uh, socialist, uh, democratic socialists as they call themselves. So they're trying to look for alternatives to this neoliberal model that has failed here and has failed in everywhere else. So the rhetoric from the right is saying condemning socialists and socialism. And if they could show Venezuela as, a, a, as somewhere where socialism is supposedly failing, then uh, you know they could use that electorally. But you have to ask your question, you know, are the problems in the United States because of socialism, or I mean, are the people in Flint, Michigan, having contaminated water because socialism, or because the government was spending money outside and in fighting wars in Libya, Syria, and other places that didn't take care of the water system for their own communities? Who is really to blame? Is it socialism, or is this the predatory capitalism and militarism that's spreading out, you know, throughout the world? Look, diplomacy is something very, very dear to us and to the Bolivarian Revolution. I mean, even, even with the United States. I mean, currently, and, and that's something we should always say, we've always been open to dialogue with the United States, and it's something that we've always promoted. And President Maduro has always said, you know, I'm willing to talk to President Trump, and as long as there's a relationship of respect, that's something that we're willing to do, and, and we're always open 
to having a, a, a serious discussion. We believe in diplomacy. We believe that we have to strengthen our ties with, with the rest of the world. Um, you know, Venezuela traditionally just looked upwards to the United States and, and not, e not even to its neighbors. We were always, uh, this is a region that always gave its back to its neighbors. And then after the Bolivarian Revolution started, we began to sort of change that. And, and you know, the, the, the system grew, the inter-American system grew uh, to have more, not, not, not just, the, you know, the, what the old structures, but the new structures that really created relations between other Latin American countries. I mean, we had CELAC as, you know, the, the community of, of states of Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, we had, you know, ALBA, which is a political uh, um, organization uh, within uh, our own region that defends the principles of, you know, uh, towards uh, socialism in the 21st century. And we've had uh, other, uh, um, uh, outside of, of our region as well, other ties to other countries. I mean, we had a, a good cooperation with Russia, with China, with Turkey. Um, so, you know, we're, we're in other countries, I mean, again, the idea is that we, we believe countries should help each other and complement each other, not exploit each other, or not, you know, set rules that, you know, I give you this in exchange for this, or you have to make the so-so changes inside your country. I think we, we live in cooperation, we believe in dialogue, we believe that that's necessary so that countries can be really independent and, and, and have their own uh, resources to, to move forward. Look, I think the Venezuelan people have, have for a long time been uh, uh, growing weary of violence and, and, and you know, and, and people want to live in, in a peaceful society. People don't want to see a coup d'etat. People are, are very dear of their democracy. I mean, we've had 25 elections in the last 20 years. That's something that we like to do. I mean, this has become a culture participation and and you you can see even most I'm sure you take a poll in the streets or anywhere you can see most of the people including people from the opposition they don't want to see a coup d'etat they don't want to see a conflict they want to see ways in, in which we can democratically solve our differences but they don't want to see violence they don't want to see these uh, these attempts so there's a lot of there's a, there's a reaction um, that usually uh, you know I, I, I believe you know the enemies of Venezuela think that because they're promoting uh, uh, this craziness here, that self-proclaimed president, or you know these uh, actions against the country, that people are going to immediately break down. And I think it's the opposite. I think the Venezuelan people uh, gather together and defend uh, their sovereignty and defend the democracy. I think it's something that we hold very dear. You can see that on the people in the street. I was very surprised to see the numbers of people that came out to sign, uh, you know, a, a statement you know, in, in rejection of uh, of the attempts of, by the U.S. To, of, of, you know, menacing Venezuela and, and, and a coup. And, you know, these are people that have other things to do. These are people that have, you know, the, the, they leave their workplaces and they come here, you know, in the middle of the day under the sun because they want to make a statement, because they mean something to them. Again, it, it, it's sometimes hard to understand for people who are not from Venezuela, but, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that, the spirit here changed, the attitude here changed, There's, the people are politically engaged. For one side or the other, but people are politically engaged. People like to do politics, people like to solve their differences democratically. People don't want to see, you know, these tensions and this violence anymore.